This podcast is made possible by High Radius. Hello, this is Chris Greiner here with Zeta Global, and you're listening to the CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 810. Have a financial system that was designed to, to measure transactional businesses. And you're right, the digital transformation will get us there. And for us and everybody else, it's a multi-year journey. And we have to change the engine while the plane is in the sky. And some of it's a little hard and kludgy and, and manual, but we are measuring those key components of customer lifetime value, even when the system doesn't make it easy for us, because that is what will ultimately drive the success of our business. Hi, it's Jack. On today's show, we speak with David Barnes, CFO of Trimble. Generally, when legendary CEO Roger Enrico wasn't happy, most every PepsiCo executive from the most junior grade on up knew about it. And so when David Barnes was told he would be presenting to Enrico, he knew he had better share some new insights gleaned from the snack and beverage giant's vast pools of data. 25 years later, David Barnes is still looking to glean insights from vast pools of data. This time as CFO of Trimble, the Sunnyvale, California industrial technology company with annual sales of more than four billion. Our talk with CFO David Barnes begins after this. Did you know more than 60% of B2B invoices are paid late? Well, then it should come as little surprise that the priorities of finance leaders have shifted towards accelerating cash recovery and scaling business growth. To address this issue, High Radius now connects your credit billing and invoicing, cash application deductions, and collections into a single business process and empowers your finance team to champion your business's high-performance culture. More than 700 of the world's leading companies have transformed the office of their CFO with high radius, unlock working capital, and reduce bad debt with the best AI-powered accounts receivable management software. To learn more, visit us at highradius.com. Hello, we're speaking with David Barnes, CFO of Trimble. David, welcome. Thank you. Good to have you with us. Uh, as always, we begin with this question like you to take a look back for us and try to identify and share some of those experiences you feel prepared you for a CFO role. David, what would those be? Sure. Well, I maybe unlike some of your listeners, I didn't start my career thinking I was going to be a CFO. Uh, I left college or started college thinking I was going to be an engineer. And then I burned up the laboratory equipment and the Lab manager said maybe a different line of, uh, of work would be better. And I found my way into strategy consulting. And I am still a bit puzzled as to how I was qualified for that job coming out of college. Uh, but I started out working in strategy at Bain and & Company and then moved into the Pepsi organization where strategy is part of finance. And so that's pretty much how I began an exposure to finance as a career. And that was a time when the nature of the finance job, a CFO uh, role, was, was changing from being less technical and more strategic and holistic. And it turns out the background I had in strategy consulting and some of the experiences I had uh, gave me skills and insights that were useful in a finance role. So that's how I got going. Now, David, were you uh, at Pepsi in the 90s then, not to... I was. Uh, I mean, can can you give us a little sense of the, the type of role you stepped into there? And again, Pepsi, of course, has a great uh, finance development tracks and what have you. Were 
was that part of your experience or was it a shorter uh, tour of duty there? Yeah, I joined Pepsi from, um, as I said, for management consulting and strategy. I actually was attracted to Pepsi by someone who was the great mentor of my career and sponsor, uh, Indra Nui, who ultimately went on to be CEO of PepsiCo. Uh, but she hired me to be the strategy lead for one of the PepsiCo divisions, uh, actually an obscure division at the time, back when Pepsi owned the restaurant business, the food supply division of Pepsi needed a strategy lead. And so there I was uh, in that role. And uh, that's how I launched my career in finance. Now, uh, again, I, I use the term Bainey. You were a Bainey and you, because you had your sort of strategy credentials, you came into this strategic role more than a finance role, it sounds that's like. That's right. You know, in, in PepsiCo at that time, I think it's still the case. The idea was to link strategy to execution and uh, the strategy teams were highly integrated with the financial planning teams. The idea is that strategy is all about decision making and resource and capital allocation. And so the, the strategy lead for each piece of the company needed to be um, needed to be sort of in the weeds with the numbers and the, the financials. And that's the way Pepsi sort of made strategy real. And so that was that's how I got into finance. At the time, again, in Dury Nuri, you mentioned uh, she was was she CFO at that time, or she wasn't uh, yet CEO. Is that she right? She was not even CFO at the time. She was I don't know what her title would have been, senior vice president of strategy for Pepsi. Interesting. No, I uh, we've had someone else on the podcast in the past, and it's not going to come to me, but also uh, was perhaps a part of a group that she oversaw, and it was a there were a number of large acquisitions and and whatever that 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 group was always uh, involved with. Now that we know where you you came from, there, where did you first step into a CFO role? Well, I don't know if you'd say CFO, but a divisional CFO role came to me uh, at Pepsi. I was, as I said, for the, one of the divisions, I was the uh, leader of strategy and financial planning. And it was a really exciting project. We had to uh, understand why we were, we at Pepsi and our restaurant business were much less profitable outside the United States than our biggest peer McDonald's was. And Pepsi hired a big consulting firm and they dumped a lot of data on us, but we couldn't find the insights. So Indra asked me to work with the consultants and get some insights uh, and wisdom out of all this data. And that was a great opportunity for me. I actually presented the results of that work to Roger Enrico, who was at that time the CEO of PepsiCo, just real genius. And I think coming out of that role then, uh, the biggest decision we had to make in the international restaurant business of Pepsi was how aggressively to grow in China. And it was a small money losing business at a time when the Asian economies were in a deep recession. So the question was, should we keep going? Should we give up? Should we double down? And Pepsi through uh, Roger Enrico and Indra uh, wanted someone from uh, a known quantity from the, with the corporate interests at heart to go to China. And so that was my first broad finance role. I was responsibility uh, for finance and for development, i.e. Uh, new store activity in China for KFC and Pizza Hut. And that's the first time I had a full finance role. I had responsibility for all the accounting teams, dotted line for the internal audit teams, had to produce the financials, do the reporting. Uh, and I was pretty green, uh, but I dove into it head first. Interesting. Uh, again, Roger Enrico, a pretty high profile uh, CEO way back when. I know we can't uh, the Frito Lay uh, uh, acquisition or what have you. I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on some of the details there, uh, but just the notion that you presented, there was this perhaps a particular day or meeting where you had to get up and present to him. Had you already a rapport, uh, or was this the first time you're presenting <laughs> to uh, Roger and Uh I had been in the same room as uh, he was, but it's safe to say he didn't know who I was. He had other bigger things to think about every day. I was young. I think I was about 
30 years old, and he was very frustrated with the restaurant business, and he was very frustrated with these consultants he'd hired to help figure this out, and was a super smart guy, very impatient with uh, people who would present a bunch of facts and no insights. And so I think with Indra's guidance uh, and with the training I had, I was able to create useful insights and it was a probably life-changing moment where he noticed that, okay, this, this person has something to add. And that was the catalyst for me really changing the direction of my career. And it's moments like that. I do think that careers often open new doors and, and off you went to China, uh, basically. That's right. <laughs> also in the past, you know, you've had multiple CFO roles outside of Pepsi. When was it time? What, what was the itch you finally had that led you move uh, beyond Pepsi? Well, the first thing I'd say is Pepsi moved away from me and my colleagues. And actually, I think the the insight that caused Pepsi to spin off the restaurant business into what is even today called Young Brands was that fateful presentation I made. Uh, the short story is that the Pepsi organization under Roger Enrico was really focused on creative big ideas and the results of our our uh, investigation was that the restaurant business was about relentless grinding execution and Roger and Indra decided that a business of relentless grinding execution would be would best succeed outside the PepsiCo organization so the spin-off happened while I was there uh, literally as I packed my bags to go to China one of the things I had to do was negotiate the beverage contract between the new company, Yum! and uh, Pepsi. And I, I was told that Roger Enrico was very annoyed at my, my, uh, my difficult negotiations. Uh, so the organization split, and I was with, with Yum! for several years more in China after it was a separate company. And the only reason I left there was um, I, it was time for my family to come back to the United States, and I had groomed someone who was perfectly capable to do the job I was in, who was a local Chinese employee, and I desperately didn't want to stand in the way of her success. And it just seemed the right thing to do. And what Yum had for me in the U.S. was, um, was I thought, not the best for me. So that's I parted from Yum, having really learned a lot, uh, I think had a good impact. I was part of something really exciting. We set the set the table for a dramatic growth uh, opportunity there. Yum China is now a separate uh, public company uh, with massive market capitalization. It's been fabulously successful, and I am really gratified to have played a role when it was just getting going. Again, it seems to me your next chapter, though, could have been, it didn't have to be a CFO role. It could have been any one of a number of roles. Am I correct about that? And I'm curious, you become a little more focused on finance, though, along the way. And I'm wondering how that happened. So am I right about you could have gone any number of ways? You're really not saying, OK, I need to be a CFO. It's not like that. Yeah, my career path has been probably less planned than a lot of, of other folks you talk to. Uh, I, As I said, when I started my career, I never saw myself as a, as a CFO. And in fact, if I had stayed at Young, uh, I would have been in the restaurant development organization helping plot the development strategy back here in North America. Um, but I was attracted to finance because at that time, and this is a long time ago, late 90s, finance was emerging from a technical function dominated by people who were steeped in accounting and technical accounting and treasury or banking to being a strategic business partner for generalist leaders. And I I learned in my consulting career, it was an incredible opportunity at Bain. Here I was 23, 24 years old, and I got to play a small, even behind the scenes role in wrestling with the biggest issues a big company faced. And that's compelling to me. The broader the issue, the broader the scope, if it's about strategy and people, resource allocation, that's what I find interesting and exciting. And I quickly figured out that with someone with analytical skills who likes numbers, uh, can you can have a really terrifically impactful role as CFO of an organization where finance is valued in that way. 
So that's how my career migrated to finance. It capitalized on this analytical, data-driven approach that I that I developed to business, but also allows you to look at the whole thing. And that was compelling and exciting for me. I just want to mention, uh, before we find out about Trimble, uh, I just want to mention your career. Uh, we could spend a whole ep- episode on your career, but you do move on and you open CFO chapters uh, at such companies as as Radio Shack, Coors, Brewing, uh, and uh, a number of other companies before you reach Trimble. So uh, again, it's it's an interesting resume, different types of companies, uh, I would say as well. Uh, so it doesn't seem like you became very uh, industry specific, although originally restaurants, food, cars, I guess you could argue. Tell us about your mindset about industries. It seems like you're a generalist in a meaningful way. Yeah, it all started with my experience at Bain and Company. At Bain, everyone was a generalist. The The theory was that in any business organization, there will be specialists who really know the, the details of the market that's served and the customers and the competitors. But a rigorous analytical discipline can add value across industries. And that training that I got early in my career prepared me to be nimble across industries. And even today, I serve as the chair of the audit committee and on a board of a company that's dramatically different from Trimble or anything else I've done. But I I have learned that if you have the humility to know what you don't know and to ask questions and to talk to the experts, that a, a skilled finance leader can figure things out quickly. I'll tell you, Trimble, we're a very diverse and exciting and complicated company, and it took me a while to learn. But the the good news of my career is that I've developed a capacity to get up to speed on new things quickly. And I do think there are elements common to every business. I'm so blessed for my Bain experience and having learned the rigorous discipline of figuring out what makes a business tick. What are the key drivers of success? We had a model when I was at Bay, and I hope and presume they still use it. We would talk about customers, costs, and competition, which is just a framework for knowing all the constituencies and the value drivers. And that experience allowed me to come into a completely new business and figure things out quickly enough that I could add value. When I went to China, yes, I'd been at Pepsi, involved peripherally in the restaurants, but every day was scary because at the beginning, I was asked to deal with things I didn't know very much about, surrounded by people who had more experience than I did. And that's just something I learned to cope with. I learned to figure stuff out, to ask questions, to be aware of what were the limitations of my knowledge and be careful not to make a big mistake, but to figure things out quickly, ask good questions, find a way to add value as the person from an, from an outside perspective. And I think there's a big role for people to add value in businesses. You have to be nimble. You have to be willing to be scared. You know, it's interesting. I talk to so many people who limit themselves because they only want to do what they know, what they're already comfortable with. My career, as you said, is a series of wildly new adventures that challenged me constantly. And it helped me be more effective uh, and wiser at each succeeding job. Well, we do have a few more uh, career-related questions for you. Probably we'll ask them during the mentoring round, unless something springs up that you want to share along the way, David. I don't want to uh, curtail you in any way. But let's find out now about Trimble. What type of company is this? And you joined in 2020, early 2020. What type of company is this and what are its offerings today? Sure. Well, we are an industrial technology company and we have... Uh, All of our work oriented around transforming the way the world works, and that's not just a slogan for us. It actually does describe what we do, but we apply software and hardware technology to dramatically transform the way work is done in our core end markets, and the biggest of those is construction and agriculture and transportation. We use hardware and software technology to make the workflows in those businesses more efficient safer, more environmentally friendly, uh, better for all key stakeholders. So we are literally transforming the way 
buildings are built, the way roads are constructed, the way farms are farmed, uh, the way transportation happens all around the world. Now, this business, is it, uh, forgive me, I don't know the specific revenue number, but it's over $3 billion today. Is that right? Yeah, our guidance for this year would have us around $4 billion for uh, for this fiscal year. You arrive, and what is the chapter as a CFO stepping into this role? What is it that you're being tasked with? And I, I, I took a quick look over some recent press releases. Uh, there are acquisitions. There are parts of the business that you're selling, I guess, and, and parts that you're acquiring. Or how how would you characterize this chapter? Well, I joined Trimble when the prior CFO was elevated to the CEO role. We are a company with incredibly stable leadership. We're a 45-year-old company that's now on our third CEO, uh, and the the current sitting CEO is the CFO. So I had some big shoes to fill. Uh, my first job was not to mess anything up because the company was very strong. Uh, and but we 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 had plans, and I think like all of your other listeners, all the plans we had going into 2020 got messed up by this thing called COVID, which was on no, as far as I can tell, I've never met a CFO who can convincingly tell me that he or she had had a pandemic on the top of their list of, uh, of enterprise risks. Uh, so shortly after I joined Trimble, we were focused as a leadership team on ensuring that we were ready and able to withstand whatever this pandemic did to our company while still making us stronger for the future. So that was a all-consuming exercise for the first several months, nine months of my time at Trimble. Is there a uh, was this company in uh, the nature of how it does its business? Do you think perhaps was it more vulnerable to whatever COVID, the dynamics that it unleashed on us all? Well, about half of what we sell, a little less than half, is is hardware. And when the pandemic hit, the the dealers who sell our hardware around the world were mostly shut down by order. So when you got a big part of your company uh, that is not allowed to transact business, that makes you more vulnerable than, let's say, a software business. And in fact, our software business actually kept growing even through the very early days of COVID. But we, like so many other businesses, we were facing a really uncertain times when COVID hit particularly around our our electronic hardware business. And that was what we were focused on planning for. This company has transformed over time. I imagine it looks very different than it did even 20 years ago, 10 years ago, perhaps. Uh, can you give us the nature of how the business will change going forward? I mean, you know, if we went back 10 years and go forward 10 years, is it serving different industries? Is it adding new industries? Yeah, I'll go back to the founding of the company in the 70s. Charlie Trimble was an engineer who'd been at Hewlett Packard, and he was a pioneering developer of global positioning system um, technology. So we, we evolved from a GPS company to a company that applied positioning technologies, including GPS, to certain end industry verticals and got to the point where we are now. Going forward, we are all about our platform strategy, which is creating these platforms of software and hardware, which can include our offerings and partnering or permitting uh, open to offerings of other companies that work in an integrated fashion to transform the way these industrial processes work. If I start with construction, that's a, a very interesting end market. There are so many technology offerings that construction companies use. They each deal with a different point solution, a different need that a, a designing firm or a contractor or an owner has, and they typically don't talk to each other very well. And as a result, there's a lot of reentry and data confusion, and the construction industry is plagued by inefficiency and rework and busting budgets. And the world needs technology that brings all this data together that optimizes the process. So. We, going forward, we think we're in really attractive end markets, so I don't see us needing to add new, totally new businesses, but we do need to add to our the capability of our platforms that really fix these need for integrated solutions in our target markets. 
Part of what we like to discuss with finance leaders is their visibility into the business and how uh, the digital age has perhaps allowed your lines of sight to to grow and extend deeper. Curious to hear whether your lines of sight have grown and whether you're content with uh, the visibility you have into this business. Is it the same numbers that you're looking at that uh, uh, from the time you first arrived and the CFO before you handed over, here are the you know the metrics that matter. Have you have you learned uh, begun to measure certain dynamics differently? What would you tell us? The roots of Trimble, as I mentioned, are selling hardware and transactional business, and our model is evolving as we focus on these these platforms to recurring relationships with customers. That requires measuring new and different things. And our ERP systems are not actually well designed to track uh, recurring revenue, customer retention, customer lifetime value. So that's one major challenge at Trimble is we have to evolve our business processes and our business technologies from ones that are geared toward a transactional business model to one that are geared toward sustaining interaction with customer success. The other big evolution at Trimble is we have made, we have made uh, dozens, probably over a hundred acquisitions in the last 10 years. And we have a big challenge in bringing all those businesses together, because as I mentioned, our strategy is about providing connected solutions that solve industry problems. And it's a big challenge when each business has its own ERP system, its own CRM system. So we, we are working our way through that. We are engaged in a massive investment in digital transformation. We're, we're in the early to mid innings of that transition, but it's a, a huge focus of, for myself and the whole leadership team. Just trying to get a sense of when you talk about digital transformation, what is it that you expect to have achieved as you near the completion of this journey? And I know it's quite long, no doubt, extending into the future, but how, you know, and again, I began by asking lines of sight. I would imagine you're telling us, yes, my lines of sight will have improved after this digital journey is over. But what is it also, you know, what is going to be, what is it going to accomplish for you? What What is it going to really deliver? Yeah, I'll start with what it's going to deliver for the customer. Uh, our customers will be able to self-provision the solutions they buy from Trimble in one common platform. They'll be able to see what they have licenses for, add more licenses. They'll be able to more easily get the customer support that they need. So that's the part of the customer value proposition. For us, we will uh, for our salespeople, we'll be able to understand much better than we can today what customers already have, be able to predict what they need. And then these recurring metrics that I mentioned of knowing knowing what is the customer retention in a particular business, having predictive analytics to say if a customer's usage of a technology is going down, that's a warning signal that they might not be engaging with your solution and might be at risk of churn. So this whole... Uh, technology will give make uh, everything easier for our customer and will give our people, including our financial people, a lot more real-time insight into what is happening in the business. Did it require, and, and I, again, I don't necessarily want you to get into naming brands or software tools specifically, but did it challenge your way of thinking in terms of uh, will you have more independent tools be part of this? It's not like you're buying, like we used to hear about buying huge ERP implementations that would be global in nature. I'm wondering if there was sort of an open-mindedness to adopting perhaps best-in-class tools versus the bigger platform. And as I say that question, it already seems a little dated to me, but I'm asking it anyway. No, it's a good question. Yeah. The um, I can use a, a brand. Uh, we are in in our digital transformation. The core technology stack that we are building, which will be common across the company, which is new for us because we were many acquisitions, which many of which were left pretty much alone with their own business processes and their own business technologies. But we are heavily focused on moving toward an integrated instance of Salesforce as the 
key system of record for managing our relationships with customers. So over time, we will have more and more of our critical business data in Salesforce in our CRM system and less in our ERP. Our ERP will be more of a financial repository than the key transactional system for our business. As it goes forward, and again, you, you're waiting for this technology to deliver. Meanwhile, business goes on and you so often have to raise the profile of a certain metric or number across the organization. And I'm wondering, uh, two and a half years into your uh, latest chapter here, whether there was a particular metric when you arrived that uh, deserved closer attention, let's say. Um, and maybe it was just part of the organization that you needed to educate them as to why this number mattered more than it did. I don't know. But uh, is anything come to mind when I, I ask you, is there a particular metric or number that you helped to raise the profile or draw the attention uh, to educate the organization why it was important? There is. Um, when you're in a recurring revenue offering kind of business, you move away from revenue and gross margin and operating profit as the key metric to focusing on customer lifetime value. And customer lifetime value is a little tricky to calculate, but you need to, the, the key inputs are how likely are you to retain that customer? If a, a third or a half of the customers drop off, you may have a lot of good revenue now, but the lifetime value of that customer is lower. You need to think about how much can you expect to cross sell or upsell? How much can you build your business uh, with that company? And obviously the margins factor in too, but customer lifetime value is really the core metric for an engaged ongoing revenue business. And so we in finance are focused heavily on having consistent and reliable ways to measure customer lifetime value and all the constituent components across our business. It's tough to do when you have a, have a financial system that was designed to, to measure transactional businesses. And you're right, the digital transformation will get us there. And for us and everybody else, it's a multi-year journey. And we have to change the engine while the plane is in the sky. And some of it's a little hard and kludgy and, and manual, but we are measuring those key components of customer lifetime value even when the system doesn't make it easy for us, because that is what will ultimately drive the success of our business. As you look to uh, help the organization better grasp customer lifetime value, better understand it, better understand how it impacts that their particular area, uh, is that something your FP&A professionals are involved in? Or I don't know how you might characterize it, but we always like to touch on the FP&A team and uh, you look at it as a team, you look at it as individuals. I'm not sure, uh, but can you give us some of your mindset when it comes to FP&A professionals in your organization? Sure. In fact, I was just with our head of FP&A a few moments ago before we started this conversation. And we were talking about exactly this. How well are we doing in consistently measuring the drivers of customer lifetime value and he and his team are absolutely integral to driving consistency and how we measure these critical variables. How do we gather the data when the systems don't make it easy to do so? How do we ensure consistency across the company? And there are always these very interesting corner cases where you have business models that are a little different and what's the right way to apply it. I have found that if you're going to a CFO, the one of the most important people in your organization is the financial planning person, uh, that team needs to be real generalist. They need to be highly data driven, but they need to get not to get lost in the data. They need to have the big, big picture in mind. And we are blessed to have an FP&A team here that 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 uh, embraces that duality of lots of data, but also getting the big picture right. And it's really important to my success. Right now, I want to ask you about talent. You. Uh began by mentioning COVID and the pandemic and the impact of it on your organization. And uh, people have become top of mind clearly because of the pandemic, but uh, the headlines uh, regarding the great resignation and what have you has revealed something. And I'm wondering whether your talent mindset has 
been altered in some way and whether uh, your world, the, the world of finance and the HR world are intersecting and perhaps communicating a good deal more as you look to perhaps uh, address some of the challenges that the talent world is putting forth at this place in time. What would you tell us about finance and talent uh, and your mindset? Well, I'll start by saying that I've always viewed that the best finance leaders are the ones that can see the big picture. And in any big organization, having people aligned and motivated with the right talents and skills is essential to financial success. So that's sort of an enduring observation that if you're going to do your job well as a CFO, you really better understand what makes the people tick, how you make the company attractive to the right kind of talent, how you reward the right kind of talent, how you develop those people. So all of that is sort of always been essential. I think the pandemic changed my thinking in a few ways. One of them is that I, I think the trust of your employees is hard to measure, but is critically important. And that trust is tested when you have a lot of uncertainty and people are worried. And so we went through the early stages of the pandemic, having really no basis to forecast how bad things might get. We knew we needed to cut our costs. We didn't want to do a massive layoff or do something that would be disruptive to our people and that would weaken the company longer term. So we went through a process of doing graduated salary reductions with the highest reductions for the most senior people like me, and actually no reduction for the people at the lowest end of the pay range and, and everybody else was in between. And what was amazing to me, Jack, was that the engagement of our people went up, not down, when we went through this process. And I credit the leaders of this company for a long time, long before I got here, for developing that kind of trust with people that you could have this holistic collective commitment to the common purpose and common good. Now, we restored everyone's pay as soon as the, the world recovered faster than we thought. But boy, I learned that you, you need to have the faith and trust and commitment of all of your colleagues to be, to be able to withstand a crisis. That's one observation. The other observation I'll make is much more pedestrian, which is that we have learned technology enables people to work in ways we never envisioned when they're not all in the office. And we're just now figuring out what this means for the long term. We have a lot of experimentation going on within Trimble. Uh, working on different models. We're really empowering our our frontline business leaders to figure out what, what model of in-person, in-the-office interaction is needed to do their work. But I think it will we will be more flexible than we used to be, which will enable us to get talent we wouldn't have had access to if you expect everyone to drive to an office in Sunnyvale, California or, or Westminster, Colorado that sort of leaves out a lot of really smart people. And in many cases, we can attract talent in places that we hadn't, we wouldn't have before. So I, I think the, one of the really enduring great companies endure the, have this sense of common purpose, this commitment to one another, the sense that what the organization is doing is important, that the company has values they share. I credit the the emerging younger generation with putting more emphasis than mine did on, on what kind of business they want to be a part of. And I think to be an effective finance leader, you do need to understand that equation. And I spend a lot of time with our HR teams working on that. Excellent. Thank you. Very nice overview for us there, David. Thank you for that. We're going to jump to what we refer to as our finance strategic moment question. You've already shared quite a few uh, strategic moments with us. Uh, but this is just one standalone that we like to have uh, sort of a, a little little past the middle of the podcast where we say, hey, just share with us one moment of strategic insight that you've had along the way in your career. Might have been back at Pepsi, might have been at Kurs, might have been at uh, some of your other CFO tours of duty. But what comes to mind when we ask for a finance strategic moment? And again, this is your lines of sight as a finance leader allowed you to see something, an opportunity, a risk, something. What comes to mind? 
I love to share one moment that was pivotal in, in my development. Uh, it was when I was in China working for uh, what is now Yum Brands. I think we just spun off from Pepsi. And we had to make a decision about where and how fast to continue to invest in the KFC brand in China. And in the late 90s, there have been so many uh, financial upsets and recessions people don't remember, but that was a very severe one. And consumer spending was going down. And our company had a holiday, and the holiday was celebrating the founding of the People's Republic of China. And since I took July 4th off on my own when my colleagues didn't, I decided I would work on that day. Uh, and I remember sitting in my office in Hong Kong, the building was empty, surrounded by data about how we could predict which restaurants were working, where sales were going up, and which weren't. And I won't drag you through all the detail, but surrounded by all of this data, I found an insight that I and my colleagues had missed, which was rooted in the unique strategic advantage KFC had over all other Western restaurant brands in China. And what we quickly realized was that we had an opportunity that our competitors didn't have to build in secondary and tertiary cities in China, and that was the key to growth. And that process, surrounded by data, having talked to my colleagues, figuring out that there was a better way to do capital and resource allocation. I remember the, the day after Chinese National Day, I went to the guy who ran the business, who's an absolute genius, one of the smartest people I ever worked with. And I, I, I said, you know, Sam, I'm, I'm sitting here with all this data, and I think it says something very different from what we've been thinking. And I think there's a new direction. And he asked some questions. And in 45 minutes, he said, this is amazing. This is a great insight. He told me, I wasn't so glad you came here. You were sort of sent by corporate. I was wondering whether you're going to do anything useful. This is really useful. Let's get at it. And it was so fulfilling to use this ability I had, this experience I had with getting into a lot of data and finding the insight that would help drive a business. It was incredibly fulfilling. Hi, it's Jack. I hope you're enjoying our interview with CFO David Barnes of Trimble. As David explained, he arrived at Pepsi inside this strategy group led by Indra Nui, who, of course, would go on to become CEO after a tour of duty as CFO. She just climbed the ranks out of this unique strategy group that Pepsi had that was really changing the course of finance within the organization, turning it into a, a strategy finance organization. And I want I, I just want to point out the timing here, really. The 90s, uh, perhaps the latter half of the 90s, uh, go 30 miles up the Merritt Parkway from uh, PepsiCo's Purchase New York headquarters to Westport, Connecticut, where at the time, of course, GE is headquartered, a similar transformation is underway. Uh, and Jack Welch, of course, writ, wrote all about that in his book, Straight from the Gut. But it's that unique place in time where suddenly finance and strategic finance is sort of catching fire in these uh, in the boardroom as well as uh, within the organization. And David Barnes happened to be there and see it happen, which I always think is exciting when we get a executive who can look back and say, yep, I was there. Our interview with David Barnes continues after this. We're going to jump to our mentoring round where we're going to ask you several quick questions intended to inform and inspire future finance leaders. Uh, we always begin with this one, which is to, when you stepped into a CFO role for the very, very first time, you get to choose which one, but really when all the responsibility for the first time fell on your shoulders, if you could go back and give yourself a piece of advice that first 30 days, that first 60 days, 90 days, let's say, what would it be? You know, I think as finance people, we, we tend to put too much reliance on data. We think the truth is in a spreadsheet or on an income statement or a balance sheet. My advice to finance people is to recognize early on that what drives any business 
is the people and their wisdom and judgment. So for any new finance leader, you need to spend more time meeting people, understanding their perspectives, developing an independent point of view of their strategic wisdom, whether they have insight into the business drivers, figuring out what really matters to customers, what drives competitive performance, understand the business model and the economic drivers. New CFOs need to do that absolutely as much as they, much time as they do staring at the books. Excellent. We'd like to ask our guests to reflect a little bit on the personal side for us. Uh, David, we're wondering if there's a personal habit that you have or part of a daily routine. It might be something that uh, a family member uh, is more likely to point out to us, people who know you, that's just what David does. Is there a, some sort of habit or a routine that you have that kind of sets you apart? Yeah, I think there are people that I've worked with, including here at Trimble, who are somewhat amused and occasionally surprised that I refuse to have any discussion about even an urgent business issue without connecting somehow on a personal level with the people I'm dealing with. And I want to know something about their state of mind, their lives. I like to make that personal connection. I like to have people, even in a very difficult situation, find a reason to smile or laugh. I find that at the end of the day, we're all human beings. And if we just get into the numbers and the details, we lose the opportunity to connect and we won't have a fulfilling and optimal interaction. So I think some folks here think I'm odd, no matter how urgent the issue. You know, we went through COVID. Uh, I, my favorite topic in, uh, in, uh, in the COVID phase was, what's behind you? Uh, tell me about that picture. Why do you like that one? Uh, how old is your cat? Uh, I, I just find that if you can connect with people in a way where you show genuine interest in who they are as human beings, you'll get much more quickly to the essence of any real business issue. Now, I suspect, and again, I think this is worth uh, uh, ask following up on, only because many finance leaders struggle with this. As they look to broaden their role and communicate with more people across the organization, they're challenged in certain ways. And from your past, I would imagine it's unconventional in terms of uh, you were a strategy consultant, which from the start, you're being deployed on client sites and uh, building rapports you're very focused on um, as you go along. But I'm wondering, well, maybe not. Maybe David decided at one point in time he really needed to focus on how to do a better job reaching out to people. I don't know. Were you born this way, David, or is this uh, something you acquired along the way when you think about it? The truth is I'm, a, I'm an awkward introvert. Uh, I think many people in finance probably are that way. But I have observed that the most effective leaders do develop that rapport and connection. And I think it's it was less natural for me than it was obvious that the people, including finance leaders, but generally the leaders who did the, the most effective work had a great connection with the people around them. The CEO of Coors was, was and is an amazing guy. And I think his example more than any other taught me this. We would, we would go into the brewery of Coors with the graveyard shift, the people working in the packaging lines from midnight to 8 a.m. And the way he was able to interact with those folks and find out what was important to them, get insights from them on what was happening in the business, was incredibly engaging. And the, the teams wanted him to be successful. They knew he cared about them. And I watched how he did it. And it was much more natural for him than me. And I don't do it as well as he did, but I learned a little bit and could adopt from his approach uh, what, what was feasible and what did work for me. Excellent, very, very interesting. Uh We'd like to ask if you have a book recommendation. It doesn't have to be a business book, but uh, maybe something you escape with. Maybe not. Maybe it is business. Tell us, <laughs> what would you have for us? I've got an oldie but a goodie, uh, and it was written by my fellow Boulder, Colorado resident, a guy named Jim Collins. 
Uh, the book was called Good to Great, and I think there's some observations in there that haven't necessarily stood up very well. But there's one chapter where he talks about the characteristics of what he calls a level five leader. And I remember reading that, and I thought it was brilliant and actually surprising and novel, because when he wrote that chapter, the thesis was to be an effective CEO, you needed to be hard-charging, brash, arrogant, all the things I never wanted to be and that I didn't like in other people. And the thesis of that chapter, which I encourage everybody to read, is that really great leaders embody this duality, we call it at Trimble, the polarity, the simultaneous uh, existence of two seemingly opposing forces. But, but he describes great leaders as having this incredible drive and will to succeed alongside this modest humility, this ability to connect with people, not to think that the organization is about them. Uh, and I think it's a brilliant insight. And I have spent, I think it's 20 years since I read that. I've spent a lot of time finding things he missed and I haven't found any. And I think it's not enough to be humble and nice. You also have to be decisive and driven. And sometimes the work you do as a senior leader is unpleasant and not fun, but it doesn't, you don't have to lose that humanity and that humility as you do the hard work of being a leader. So I just think that's a brilliant framework. And I encourage your listeners to go read it and think about it. You know, uh, wonderful uh, insight there for us. Thank you. We, we've had that book clearly recommended in the past, uh, but never as someone who zeroed in on that particular chapter and, and shared with us their thoughts on it. So thank you for that. Really interesting. Um, we are up to our final question. Time's gone fast. I, we appreciate it, David. Uh, you've had some really thoughtful answers for us. So thank you. Uh, we'd like you to look forward finally for us. And we were looking into the future a little bit with you about Trimble. But over the next 12 months, what are your priorities as CFO of Trimble? What would those be? You know, I think for Trimble and probably every organization out there, we're more and more aware than we ever were that the world is uncertain. Who would have thought that we'd have a pandemic looking back a couple of years ago? And I can tell you, even six months ago, I thought we would be much more clearly past the impacts of that pandemic than we are. Who would have thought there'd be a conflict and a war in Europe of the scope and scale that we've had? So my focus going forward is rooted in the humility to know that neither I nor anybody else can predict with confidence what's about to happen. We have great conviction on our strategy here. We've got a great proposition. The business we're building off is really good. We know how we can add value to our customers and the industries we serve, but we don't know what the markets will be like, what the economy will be like in the next 12 to 18 months. So I spend every day with my teams working on how we can be flexible and nimble, how we can pick up early warning signals that the markets are moving in a different direction, and how we allocate our resources, our capital, our people in a direction that will make us most resilient when this next wave of change comes by. You know, I, in the world of finance, at my time, when I was in business school, the, a lot of financial leaders were very focused on these highly analytical frameworks of, of shareholder value. And the more interesting and more recent work is all about handling uncertainty and developing agile approaches in a highly uncertain world. That's what I'm focused on, and I think that's what finance leaders everywhere need to be focused on. David Barnes, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Happy to do it. Thank you, Jack. Hello, listeners. Do us a favor. Be certain to subscribe to CFO Thought Leader on Apple Podcasts. Or if you're an Android user, check us out on Spotify or Google Play. If you like the show, please recommend it to a friend. 